Excellent. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I am Frank Lipo, and uh, it's our pleasure this um, this week today to bring you inside OPRF Museum. Um, as some of you know, as some people have been participating regularly, our goal is to once a month, um, especially during this trying time, get people inside the museum in a, in a, in a video sense. But also, of course, we are open, so we'd love to have you come, come back um, as soon as you're able to and, and join us at, physically in the museum. Um, today's look is giving you some insight into a few things that have been added to our collection and um, the sort of stories behind them. So we expect that you'll be able to see these things in the museum soon. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start off today's program um, talking a little bit about some pieces of artwork that we have received uh, very recently. Most of them came in last week. And I'll also mention a couple of things that came in a couple of months ago. Um, so the picture that you see on your screen here is how we received a couple of uh, pieces of fine art uh, last week. And um, these donations, what I'm talking about today, uh, we received all of these through people reaching out to us. I have talked in the past about how we receive donations, um, some of them being things that we have asked for specifically, but most things in our collection come to us from people reaching out and saying, I have this wonderful piece that I want to add to the museum collection. So we are very, very um, blessed in that way. So what I'll be talking about specifically is, um, pieces of fine art, and they are all examples of artwork from local artists. So um, all of these people lived in Oak Park or River Forest around the early 20th century. That's when these paintings will be coming from. And I will talk briefly about some art pieces and very briefly about the artists who created them. So starting off with uh, two pieces by Carl Kraft, who is an artist that uh, Frank and I have talked about recently um, when we gave a talk about the history of the Art League. So Kraft was the founder of the Austin Oak Park and River Forest Art League, which is today's Oak Park Art League. And they are celebrating their centennial this year. Uh, the Art League has been around for 100 years. This donation came to us from a donor named M. Christine Schwartz, who has gathered a collection of pieces by Chicago artists um, in an attempt to keep these pieces local. She lives in Chicago and um, was gathering a lot of these pieces so that they didn't get sold off to other areas of the world. And uh, thankfully, she's also been donating um, things back to other local institutions like us. Uh, this donation was also coordinated by a uh, local art historian, Wendy Greenhouse, who some of you may know, because um, she's worked with a lot of other institutions and local people. Um, and I want to thank her especially for the research that she did um, on this collection, because I used her biographies of the artists that I'm talking about today. Um, she did very good work. So um, Wendy Greenhouse mentions that Kraft's paintings are hard to date and identify uh, because he used similar names for a lot of his work. So as far as Wendy has been able to identify, the piece on the left might be called either Arcadia or Autumn Symphony and probably painted around the 1910s. And the piece on the right is untitled, but um, was probably painted in the 1920s and might have been inspired by scenes that Kraft observed in the south suburbs. So this was very um, great for me to find out because um, I live in the south suburbs in the Palis area. And apparently uh, Kraft was very inspired and often visited the what are now the forest preserves, what, are, what were then the forest preserves um, to get inspiration for his work. So of course, um, we all live in an area that's rich with forest preserves. So um, that is a great place to get inspired. The next painting 
that I'll show you here is a beautiful summer landscape titled Summer Landscape. And this was painted by Jess Hobby around 1937. So Jess Hobby is an artist that I had not heard of yet, but I'm very glad to learn about because um, he seems like a very exciting person. He lived in Oak Park after traveling with theater companies to paint the backdrops for plays. And he even painted the curtain at the Warrington Opera House, which was the building at the corner of South Boulevard and Marion that was an opera house, um, eventually became Marlac House and is now a condo building appropriately titled uh, the Opera House Condos. So Hobby was friends with and also studied with Alfred Jurgens, who is another Oak Park painter whose work we have in our collection. And this photo of Hobby comes from a profile in Oak Leaves about him in 1933. And in the article he mentioned, I quote, don't forget to mention Mickey, which is his bulldog. So that is why you can see Mickey in the picture on the right as well. Um, earlier this year, we were given etchings by another local artist, Charles Dahlgren who was also a member of the Oak Park Art League um, and one of the founders. He was most known for etches like this, although he did other paintings as well. And we have a nice collection of his work um, because I believe he was more of a commercial artist. So he, um, he died in 1955 and he lived in Oak Park for about 30 years. So I can't remember if it was the donor of these specific pieces or another donor who gave us um, other etchings of his recently in the past year or two as well. But um, either case, I talked to one of these donors who said that her parents had memories of being friends with Charles Dahlgren. So that's the interesting part for me to find out is that people around here still have memories. Um, it seems like so long ago, because um, these were probably done, um, I don't know the date specifically on these, but these were probably done in the 20s or the 30s. And um, it's so interesting that people around here still have memories of these people that seem so long ago, but it is not, they are not. Also, these pieces are titled, um, on the left, we have Foot of the Mountain, and on the right, we have Winter in the Woods. Next, I'll be talking about a painting by Robert Zupke, uh, who is most famous for his athletic career. So many of you will know him as the head coach um, and head of athletics at Oak Parker Forest High School. Um, that was between 1910 and 1913 before he moved on to become the longest serving football coach at U of I. But he was also an artist. And even in recent years, um, other examples of his paintings have been exhibited at places like U of I. He apparently did not name or date many of his works. So this one is unidentified as far as I can tell. And I'd be very interested to learn if anybody on the call or if anybody in the future can tell me more about Zapke's paintings, because I'd really like to find out more. Um, but based on our theme today, we have seen a lot of beautiful landscapes. And apparently Zapke was inspired by a lot of places that he loved to travel. So um, this is probably something of the sort. So um, I will finish my talk today um, by mentioning that these pieces are great additions to a collection of fine art and paintings that we already have in our collection by local author, um, local artists. Um, we have got a pretty good representation of different time periods and um, different artists, but we're always looking to grow. And with these donations, as well as um, jumping off from the 100th anniversary of the Oak Park Art League, um, we at Oak Park River Forest Museum are planning to put some of these items on display 
um, and making a little bit more of an art exhibit um, fairly soon. So it's still in the works, but please keep an eye out for more information on some of these pieces going up on display in the museum. And um, again, these are a really great example of exploring a lot of the local art scene, a lot of the prolific artists who have lived around here. So um, that is my talk for today. And if you have questions um, or comments, please leave them in the chat box and we will um, try to get to questions at the end. But I would like to pass this on to Frank. Frank Lipo, our executive director. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's, um, I, I appreciate your, your comments today, your thoughts. And one of the things that's really interesting when, as Rachel was talking, um, first of all, can you see me? Is it, am I, um, I'm having difficulty seeing if I'm actually. Yes, I can see you. Okay, thumbs up. Um, basically, excellent. Um, basically, um, as Rachel was saying, we often, Rachel and I know a lot about our partner in history, of course, but we learn through these collections, these things that are donated to us. We know um, when we're preparing something like the lecture she was talking about, about the 100th anniversary of the Art League, we get a chance to really delve more deeply into things. So our collection and our program to help us as staff learn more about the community's history, but also then we can communicate to you and to others about these stories. So it's, it's always kind of a, a great process, I think, at the museum, at the historical society, to sort of like keep on having building blocks of the community's history. Every time we get an interesting artifact, um, a piece of art, and it's in those cases, we can learn more about the artist and about the stories. So it's really a fun part of our job and we hope you enjoy that, that thing too. Um, but uh, she also mentioned that we often get calls, emails, people reaching out to offer us to donate things that they think have to do with Oparkin River Forest history or broadly for our community's history. Um, we also, over time, um, at the, our collection committee level, at our board level, have had discussions and have at, had active um, efforts to reach out and try to collect stories that we don't have or to try to be more um, broad and diverse in our collecting. Um, these paintings that, that you, um, you were seeing were actually from you know, a relatively long time ago, um, but we're also looking for the more recent history. And uh, one of the things um, this time of year, as you see in the image, it's graduation time. It's, it's, you know, we're all getting ready for graduation. It's been a difficult year for the schools as we've all been struggling with hybrid and face-to-face -face, uh, learning. And one of the things that we've been talking about and going back a number of months is our collection related to local schools. Of course, Oak Park River Forest High School is a large and important institution shared by the two villages. Um, but we started looking and, and saying, wait a second, we have this really strong collection of yearbooks, um, uh, virtually every year, multiple copies. And it's a real great um, opportunity for us to help people researching their families. Um, Grandpa went to OPRF and we have a, his yearbook, maybe see what he looked like back then. We don't have a copy of the yearbook. Um, and so we got talking about reaching out more aggressively and to, to kind of build our school related uh, collection. So as for so many things for our organization, we rely so heavily on volunteers with Rachel and I being the, the only two full-time staff members. And uh, we were thinking about uh, uh, Trinity and Fenwick stories. So specifically, I reached out to an incredible person. A lot of you know, uh, Beth McBride, uh, one of our members and volunteers who is a proud Trinity graduate, class of 1959. Um, also, um, besides volunteering with the Historical Society, She's been very active and has been the, uh, the archivist um, for the Infant Welfare Clinic um, and some of their uh, material. So um, like so many people in our community and so many of our volunteers have interests that cut across um, different facets of the community. So it's not just their love of history or of the historical society in our museum, but also um, get involved in other things. So I thought well, what a great starting point is asking Beth um, could she reach out as an alum and see what yearbooks that Trinity High School might have um, that actually um, would they be willing and able to donate some copies so that we could tell the Trinity story better, so that people who come into our 
um, museum, if they have a question that has anything to do with, with Trinity or its graduate or its program, we could help them learn here, in addition to, of course, always referring them back to an institution like Trinity for more information. So um, this, um, by simply talking to Beth about it, she grabbed the bull by the horns and reached out to um, um, some, some people at the high school at Trinity. She specifically reached out um, via email back in January to Mary Beth Lavazorio, um, a 1982 graduate of Trinity, and is also the director of admissions. And then uh, Mary Beth also reached out to, um, to Mary, Gail, um, Mary Gail Watts Harrington, a 1978 graduate of Trinity. And Mary Gail um, um, was able and willing to, to go and work um, in the sort of storage area of Trinity in the archives and realized that they had multiple copies of the number of years of the, of the yearbook. So long story short, we go on to the next slide now. We could. Um, Mary Gail um, reached out back to Beth and then to me, um, and we kind of hooked, um, we, um, you know, we communicated via email and then uh, in person and realized that they were able and willing to donate um, about 60 yearbooks from Trinity's history. And uh, just last week, I um, you know, went over to Trinity and picked up four boxes of these yearbooks. And um, as we were, um, and already we've sort of made up the initial list of them that comparing to the list they gave us um, that one of our volunteers, Jean Garino, was able to make a list for us and also graduate from Trinity. And um, essentially we we're so delighted to receive these yearbooks because we realized that this might be the very first yearbook from what we could figure out. First one they had, they luckily had an extra copy. Um, this is, 1922 yearbook as you see and those of you who don't realize that trinity started out as rosary high school and um of course rosary college which is now dominican university was was there also and um they literally rosary house was this this original single family home that was the first home of the high school um and in 1922 there had not even been a graduating class so they sort of started out from what i can figure out you know sort of like with the freshman class and sophomore class and they're building toward the first graduating class and um it's an incredibly interesting publication. Maybe go on to the next, um, next uh, page. Um, and it uh, has these wonderful hand drawings, you know, sort of line drawings of, of, um, of people from the class, photographs, et cetera. Um, paper copy, pretty fragile. But also amidst all of these yearbooks was the very first commencement um, booklet, the sort of first commencement, um, which is the 1922 um, commencement. And um, it's amazing to me um, that, you know, the 1921 year, but 1922 commencement, and um, it's just such a, you know, so often we don't have like the sort of the very first of something, you know, we have some early material, let's say, and uh, this was a, ex an, a wonderful bonus, not a yearbook, but something they were willing to share with us. And um, what they also provided to us was sort of a listing of the years that they had one copy of a yearbook, but so they were not able to give us a multiple copy. So looking at this list, when people come into research here, we can also refer them back to the high school if there's a year that we still don't have, but we also can promote to our members in the community that perhaps somebody has an extra copy of, of one of their yearbooks that we could um, build this collection over time. Going from, from nothing to 60 copies is wonderful one fell swoop but we like to build over time as we did with the Oak Park River Force High School yearbooks kind of gradually person by person and also by working with these institutions um so going on to the next um the next slide um of course um jumping all the way to um I we use this one to illustrate this sort of 90s right so remember the 90s <laughs> not too long ago um but of course the great thing about yearbooks and looking through these yearbooks you see the change in institution, uh, institutional sort of traditions, some things that remain the same, of course, uh, across many years. And you also see this changing fashion and styles of how people talk about things, um, which is always you know, very interesting, I think, aside from the history of someone's like doing genealogy and looking back at somebody in their family. The amazing thing about this, I mentioned that the very first um, that we have that sort of 1921 year, but exactly 100 years ago from, from today, um, we have all of these interim yearbooks, but we also were given the 2020 yearbook, which is really kind of exciting when you say 
where literally go a hundred years worth of the yearbook. So it's um, really quite an um, amazing uh, little story about how a wonderful volunteer who was able to sort of reach out on our behalf um, to the good people at Trinity that saw the value um, of having some of their history in our collection. And that's part of our job over time is to keep on broadening the stories, you know, different stories, more diverse stories of diversity in every, every way um, through the decades and through the institutions and through the, the people that we want to really represent everyone's stories in, in, our, in our collection and in our um, programming. So um, it's always a step-by-step -step process. So today um, we're able to shed a hope a little bit light on, on that process. And I think, Rachel, this is the last slide. Is, am, I, am I correct on that? Or was there a finishing slide? That's correct. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much um, for listening to me. Um, and again, just two examples. And the amazing thing is when we started talking about today's topic is these were all received, picked up or, or, or mailed, except for the couple actions, which are a little bit earlier, all within the last 10 days. <laughs> um, even though, of course, in a couple of cases, the communication goes back a number of months. It doesn't happen literally from one week to the next. But it's uh, really exciting for us that, you know, the people keep on thinking of us as a resource they they want to have some of their stories told here too and i think there's the more passive um storytelling i.e we have these trendy yearbooks in the collection so if we ever do an exhibit or a program we can pull them out and use them but also the research tool i think people um you know it's, it's something that it all it's at all different levels and then one one final um thing that i wanted to mention is on display now already are some is some artwork from um, from Tia Etu? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Right, Tia Etu, who is um, who is an artist who is um, um, had a studio on Harrison Street, going back about 25 years when Harrison Street wasn't the arts district that it's become over time, gradually and more you know by more effort. So we have that more recent history of an art an artist on on, on display. So again, even though we're talking about some of these um, these sort of far back stories, it's really exciting to have you know, the yearbooks that stretch from 100 years ago to last year, and also artists who stretch back to the glorious and important history of the Art League and some of those, those landscape painters, but also looking out and trying to kind of build those stories over time also. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Um, I am going to take over from here and um, Ask anyone who has questions, if you have something today, uh, please put that in the chat box. We can answer some questions here now, or um, in the future, you can email me with questions or any thoughts you have. Um, while you're thinking about that, I might just also um, ask anybody on the call or anybody watching this in the future, um, I myself haven't looked at the exact list of all of the yearbooks that Trinity gave to us, but I know we're missing some here and there. So if you are a past graduate yourself, or you know anybody who has a collection of yearbooks from Trinity that they would like to donate to us, or also from other schools, elementary schools, um, Fenwick, et cetera, then um, please, if you're interested, get in contact with us because um, we can always fill in gaps. Um, I will also uh, plug a couple of things that are coming up um, from the Historical Society. We have been doing walking tours um, for the past couple of months now. Um, and into the summer and fall, we have some scheduled neighborhood walking tours. So that is a small group of people led by a guide and um, walking around specific areas of Oak Park and River Forest. Um, this year, especially, we've been scheduling more walking tours in River Forest because those have been very popular. And so um, our next one is on June 12th, and that takes you around the area where the museum is located, which was originally the, the Ridgeland, the village of Ridgeland and um, sort of the historic area here. So that's a very exciting walk, I highly recommend. And um, take a look at our website for other scheduled tours, or um, if you have groups that you'd be interested in uh, scheduling your own 
walking tour for, we can talk to you about that as well. And with that, I think I will end today's program. And thank you all very much for coming. And I hope that you um, keep watching for these virtual programs that we do monthly. We've got Inside OPRF Museum on the third Thursday of every month and Ask the Historian on the last Friday of every month. So our next one will be next week. And I look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you.